Good afternoon. Welcome to the initial session of the Rule of Law Forum of the New York City Bar Association. I'm Stephen Cass. I'm chair of the Rule of Law Task Force of the New York City Bar Association. This is the first of a five-part series on the rule of law and the threats to the rule of law in the United States. It is my privilege and honor to present to you the president of the New York City Bar Association, Sheila Boston. Good afternoon and thank you so much. I am so pleased to open this forum and speak to you as the president of the New York City Bar Association, a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization of over 25,000 members across the state, the country, and the globe. As you know, we lawyers are often called upon by our clients to debate the meaning of a contract, the purpose of a statute, or the best interpretation of our Constitution. Only rarely are we called upon by our country to defend the purpose of law itself and its relationship to the institutions that define our democracy. Institutions that are increasingly under attack by both public officials and private actors. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the focus of today's forum. The relevance and timeliness of which should be clear to all members of the bar. I therefore invite you, or no, actually, I summon you. I summon lawyers throughout our nation, whether in our bar associations, law firms, law schools, corporate law departments, government agencies, or nonprofit institutions. I summon all of you to join us in this inquiry and to ask yourself, how can you contribute professionally, personally, and without regard to where you fall on the political spectrum to defending and quite frankly, if necessary, rebuilding the legal institutions that are the foundation of our democracy and our lawful society. This is lawyers' work in the most fundamental way. And it is work that we must not turn our backs on when our country needs us to speak out and to act responsibly in the best traditions of our profession. I just like to say publicly that I am extremely proud of the New York City Bar Association and its stellar work. It is an aggregation which I have proclaimed to be the bar of hope for my tenure. And I want to extend a heartfelt moment of appreciation to Steve Cass and the Rule of Law Task Force, which has worked so extremely hard to act responsibly in the best traditions of our profession and with high regard for the rule of law. And notably, protection of the rule of law is one of my six main priorities. It is a focus for the New York City Bar during my tenure. So again, thank you, Steve, and thank you to the entire task force. I so appreciate you. And now without further ado, I'll turn the floor back over to Steve Cass, who will explain how the forum will work and introduce our extraordinarily distinguished speakers. Thank you to one and all for joining us today. Let's have a great forum. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you so much. We are fortunate to have such a um, courageous and principled president. Um, let me spend a minute explaining how we're going to proceed today. Uh, during the various presentations, beginning with Professor Snyder, uh, the audience will be muted, but you will be able to uh, submit questions on the chat box and the Q&A uh, uh, bar at the bottom of your screen. We will have three opportunities for questions, one after Professor Snyder speaks, a second one after Professor Sunstein speaks, and a third one uh, more extended after uh, we've heard from Professor Vance and Mr. Parker. Uh, I think there will be an ample opportunity for public participation in this program, which is something we have regarded as important from the very beginning. Let me remind you that today's opening session will be followed by four subsequent sessions. One on September 22 next week at 1 p.m., 
The third one will be on October 8 at 11 a.m. The fourth on October 21 at 1 p.m. And the final session uh, at no on uh, November 18 at 1 p.m. Please uh, register and join us for each of those if you can. Let me thank, before we proceed further, the planning committee for this wonderful series of events. It is headed by Robert Cusimano, a member of the task force, and uh, with the assistance of the Honorable Marcy Kahn, uh, Jennifer Rogers, and Joshua uh, Draytel. We also appreciate the uh, co-sponsoring cooperation of the Association's Committees on Federal Courts, on Immigration and Human Rights Law, and of the Task Force on the Independence of Lawyers and Judges. So with those ground rules out of the way, let me now turn to our distinguished uh, and keynote speaker for this forum. Timothy Snyder is the Richard Levin Professor of History at Yale, and he is a permanent fellow at, um, at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He has uh, written um, many, many books, um, many of which you may have heard of. His most recent um, uh, books um, are On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, and America, and most recently, in fact, I think last week, um, Our Malady, Lessons in Liberty from a Hospital Diary. Uh, Professor Snyder's work has appeared um, in many languages, 40 of them. Um, he um, himself reads 10 European languages, and, but he speaks only five, he told me. Um, um, his work uh, has earned him prizes um, um, in many, many venues. Uh, in ranging from the Vaclav Havel Foundation Prize to the Hannah Arendt Prize in Political Thought. His books have also inspired poster campaigns, sculptures, a punk rock song, a rap song, a play, and an opera. We are delighted to have him here today. He is speaking to us from Vienna, and among the languages he speaks, he has chosen to address us in English. So, Professor Snyder, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much, Stephen, for the kind introduction. Thank you to, to Sheila Boston for, for the inspiring um, capsule of an introduction. Um, the, the purpose of law seems like a wonderful thing to be speaking about just now. I, I want to qualify my own ability to address the subject and say a word about how I am going to address it. As, as, as Stephen was kind enough to say, I'm a historian what I think about civic life and what I think about the rule of law comes above all from a historian's research and from a historian's habit of mind. I'm very glad that I will be joined on this panel by, by Cass Sunstein and Joyce Vance and Dennis Parker, who can address the, the specific problems or begin to address the specific problems um, of, of the rule of law in the United States. As I understand my brief, what I'm going to try to do is to discuss uh, challenges to the rule of law, challenges to the rule of law, or an epic, an era, our era, that is full of challenges to the rule of law. History, I think, can help us a little bit with this for a couple of reasons. The first is that for a historian, nothing's ever fully old and nothing's ever fully new. So. The, the daily outrages to the rule of law or to democracy may not shock us quite as much um, because we will see parallels. We will see we will see examples, and and nothing is nothing is fully old either, right? It's all everything kind of hangs together. So the you know, the, the worries that the ancient Greeks had about the rule of law, for example, um, the, the, those things still seem relevant to a historian. Historians can see things in their particularities when we work hard, but we can also see patterns. So for example, the Reichstag fire in early 1933 in Nazi Germany has its particularities. It was the particular moment when Adolf Hitler was able to begin to seize complete power. But the Reichstag fire in quotations is an example. 
It's a model for some people. It's a pattern. It's, it's a way that emergency politics can work. So what I'm going to try to do as, as a historian is address these questions of what the challenges are in, in the broadest possible way. Um, the, the, the specific topic is the hallmarks of an era challenging the rule of law. So before I get into the particular case that I want to make, I, I, I want to I stress that this question only makes sense to me if we think of the rule of law as something which is historically contingent. It's very important, of course, for, for lawyers at this moment in time to define and to personally stand for and to exemplify in their actions and their words, the rule of law. But I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, and what I can perhaps do instead is make a case for the things that we have to have in an era that would support the rule of law. In other words, if we're going to understand an era that challenges the rule of law, we also have to be able to imagine an era that supports the rule of law. Or to put it a different way, if, if our diagnosis of the problems of the rule of law is correct, it should also imply what the solutions are, are going to be. Any analysis of the problem which is correct should also suggest where we ought to be going. So that's what I'm going to try to do um, in, the next, in the next few minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you for listening to a historian. Stephen Kass assures me that uh, not everyone listening is a lawyer and not everyone listening is in New York, which I take it to be the broadest possible description of pluralism um, that was available here. So I'm very glad to join you. I'm not a lawyer and I'm, I'm, I'm not in New York. Um, and I hope very much this will be of interest. I see I see three kinds of challenges to the rule of law in the United States today. I'm going to categorize them as surface challenges, as spatial challenges, and as social challenges. So the first category, the surface challenges, I think are the kinds of things which are evident to all of us, whether we're lawyers or not whether we're citizens of the United States or not. These are examples about which my colleagues in this session and colleagues in sessions later to come will have more and richer things to say than I do. I just want to start by listing them so then we can work our way towards the, the, the spatial challenges and the social challenges. So some of the surface challenges I think that are evident have to do with a kind of circularity that's in the rule of law. The rule of law in general and our constitution in particular assume good faith. So there's, there's a, the circularity is that the rule of law requires good faith uh, and, then, and then the rule of law generates good faith. And so you have a positive reinforcement. You have a virtuous, you have a virtuous circle. But what happens when that circularity breaks down? In other words, what happens in the, pre, in the, in the clear and palpable presence of, of bad faith? So four examples of, of this kind of surface challenge. One is the, a hostile executive. So a president of the United States, for example, who would issue declarations contrary to the rule of law, um, who seems to have broken laws before he became president of the United States, who openly declares his affiliation to uh, non-rule of law systems and, and their leaders. Another, a second surface challenge would be explicit ideological attacks on the rule of law as such. So, for example, imagine an attorney general who categorized politics as a struggle between the already innocent and the already guilty and, and categorized the, the, the job of government as to defend against an ideologically defined enemy of, of, for example, secularists. That would be an explicit ideological attack on the rule of law because the rule of law assumes a system in which there isn't an us and them, but only individual legal subjects. Which leads to a third, I think, very evident surface challenge to the rule of law in this country, which is a politics of us and them. The suggestion that some of us are, are more legally, are inherently more legally subjects than others. Um, the tendency when faced with similar cases to excuse people who are like us or who hold our political views. That's also evident, unfortunately, in the highest offices in the land. And the fourth surface challenge is, um, is the one party state or the possibility of a one party state. We're obviously not a one party state now, but the tendency of one of the political parties to construct the law in such a way as, as to generate a situation where they cannot lose elections. 
that construction of the law, where law is defined, as it were, against democracy, obviously undermines the rule of in practice, but it also undermines the rule of law as a value in people's minds. If, if voting doesn't seem to be equal, then it's very difficult for people to take seriously the rule of law in general. So if we have, for example, 25 new statutes, which are voter suppression statutes in the last decade or so, that is in this rather direct way, I think, a surface challenge to the rule of law. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna now suggest that there is another category of challenges, um, the details of which are familiar to us, but maybe which we don't always conceptualize as, as part of the rule of law. Uh, and this, this set of challenges, four more of them, I'd like, I'd like to call spatial challenges. Okay, so what do I mean, what do I mean by space? Um, colleagues and questioners can correct me. Um, maybe this is a naive point of departure, but it seems to me that when we talk about the rule of law, we presume at the beginning that we're talking about a space, you know, call it a state. We're talking about a space and we're talking about a space in which the law, a space which is bounded, it has boundaries. Some laws function in some zone, other laws function in another zone. And that space is also homogenous. So inside that space, whatever it is, a city, a, a, a municipality, a state, the, 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 the federal system, that the space is homogenous, that the laws function evenly across that space. What I wanna suggest is that there are at least four ways in which that basic assumption about the rule of law is being challenged. One of them, is uh, local states of emergency, real or let's call it financially generated. So when American territories or American cities are put into states of emergency for financial reasons, that's a suspension of the rule of law. That becomes a place, a bounded place, which no longer is part of this homogeneous territory where, where law is applied. But a state of emergency can also be real um, with the, the onset of global warming is among other things, um, a series of ever growing challenges to the rule of law because each emergency will be a stronger argument than the last one for new sets of principles which don't seem to be legal principles. So one, I call it spatial challenge to the rule of law is, is emergency, fake emergency, but also real emergency. A second challenge, which seems to me to be quite important um, to the, in, the, in the present development uh, against the rule of law would be zones of lawlessness. So let me take a step back. Um, as, as a historian, zones of lawlessness are a very familiar concept to me. So for example, a, a, con a concentration camp in Germany, or for that matter elsewhere, is, was by definition a zone of lawlessness. So the, the place where the German institution, the, the SS, got its start were as guards within a concentration camp, where concentration camps were by definition a zone where law did not apply, which meant that concentration camps were a specific form of training for a specific class of man, who then, of course, went on to perpetrate, as we know, other, other crimes. Another kind of lawless zone or, or special zone is the border, you know, that, that place where citizens lose a bit of their citizenship or where, where in leaving one country and going to another, you lose a good deal of your rights. Of course, colleagues and lawyers will have more precise terminology for this. I apologize, I'm coming at this from, you know, as a generalist, but you, get, you, get, you probably get where I'm going. This, this second spatial problem, these lawless zones, they're problematic in and of themselves. I mean, if there are places in the country where the law does not apply, then that is ipso facto, um, a violation of the rule of law, but also they produce people who then have non-legal or anti-legal approaches to politics and to daily interaction. So think of Portland, Oregon, for example. If you're an American government and you want to create a new secret police force, which will behave in a lawless manner or in an anti-legal manner, where do you draw it from? You draw it from the border or you draw it from lawless zones. And of course, in the US, um, the most obvious source of lawless zones would be our huge network of detention centers. So detention centers um, create, as a lawless zone, create a reservoir of, of human potential for lawless activities beyond those zones. A third spatial challenge, I think, to the rule of law is what I would call uh, permeable sovereignty. So, it's not, by this I don't mean that international law is a problem. I mean, I mean something else. I mean something more like international lawlessness. So 
the ability of non-state and state actors to interfere directly and indirectly in American political elections is a problem of sovereignty. It, it violates our understanding that our rule of law is a bounded space. It means that there are actors with unclear intentions um, messing with the sovereignty and messing with things that happen inside it. And particularly if electoral interference can change an outcome, um, as, as Kathleen Hall Jameson, who's the expert on this subject, argued that it did in 2016. And particularly if Americans have to face looking forward to our next elections, uncertainty about this issue, um, as, as my friend and colleague David Scheimer argues in his new book, Rigged, then this, this kind of permeable sovereignty also seems to be a violation of our notion of, of what the rule of law would be. The fourth new challenge is what I would call digital law. Now, by digital law, I, I, again, I don't, I don't maybe mean the obvious thing. I don't mean the difficulty in regulating or in legislating about the, the giant software and social media companies. Um, although, of course, that, that, that is a problem. Uh, what I mean instead is something a little bit more subtle and maybe just as important, which is the way that the digital world is now law giving. That is the way that uh, being involved in social media creates emotional regularities and expectations about life, which are similar, I mean, I, I'm afraid analogous to, or maybe even displacing of the way law is supposed to function in social life. Because of course the rule of law is an abstraction. The rule of law is something which only exists if people internalize it. And what worries me, and it worries me ever more um, as social media becomes ever more important, is that the behaviorist call and response, the, be the behaviorist solicitation of emotion is a different sensibility. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of law unto itself, which creates people who have a harder time accepting the parameters, um, you know, the discipline parameters of, of a rule of law state. All right, so th those were spatial challenges. My, my third and, and final category is what I call social challenges. Um, so again, these might be things which wouldn't at first glance seem to bear directly upon law, but frankly, the things that bear directly upon law, I'm gonna leave to the rest of y'all. Um, the, 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 these are things though that I do think affect the rule of law. I think these are things which are challenges to the rule of law. So the third, the first category was surface, second category spatial, third category is, is social. Number one here, and maybe the most important, is the new American vacuum of, of factuality. So it, the, the vacuum of factuality is, of course, something I just mentioned, which is the social media. It's not just that social media don't, don't do a very good job of transforming the facts, it's that they absorb the, the advertising money and the attention which was once necessary for local news. So I think it's a very important characteristic of the United States today that, that most of the country is now a news desert. That is, most people do not have, mo people in most parts of the country, I want to get this right, in most parts of the country do not have access to a proper newspaper, even a weekly, which has local reporting, which has reporting of what's actually happening. Now, this, this vacuum of factuality, I think, bears on law in some, in some obvious ways and in some, some, some maybe ways that are more subtle, but just as important. The obvious way is if people cease to believe in fact, or they cease to take for granted the kind of daily truthfulness that's, that's supplied by reporting, it's hard to believe in law because law, of course, depends upon findings of fact. But there's something I think more powerful and more worrying going on here, which is that if we're talking about equal protection under law, um, the thing which gives people a chance, the shadow of a chance to be an equal party in a legal dispute with an entity which has greater resources than they have is access to factuality. If factuality ceases to be a public good and becomes a private good, then we then equal protection before the law becomes much harder than it was. Just to give a very daily banal example, uh, if I wanna sue someone because there's mercury in the water, I need the local reporters who are gonna find out that there's mercury in the water. If I don't have those people, I'm not gonna have a, I'm not gonna have a place even to start and in that sense, equal protection becomes more of more of an abstraction. A second social challenge, um, uh, which was mentioned, you know, which Plato makes the case for, which George Orwell makes the case for, which Ramona Holm makes the case for. A, a second social one is the inequality of wealth. 
Um, all three of those thinkers in different ways make the argument that if inequality of wealth becomes too great, then we are no longer living in the same legal world. And what is worse, or just as important, we do not believe that we are inhabiting the same legal world. Whether we are the ones who are wealthy or whether we're the ones who are not wealthy, we no longer believe that we're in the same legal world. And if it's not the same legal world, you know, if in Plato's terms there's a city of the rich and a city of the poor, then there isn't, then there isn't the rule of law. Which brings me to my, my third social concern, um, the, the third thing that I, I, the third tendency that I worry about. Um, and as I, hope, as I hope is clear, these things are meant to build on each other. So these are things are not only related, but they have a kind of cumulative relationship. So the third thing that I wanted to mention was, was cynicism. Um, the idea which, as an East Europeanist, as someone who spends a lot of time working in Eastern Europe and who spends a lot of time reading East European languages and, 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 and spends a lot of time living, you know, living with the experiences of my East European friends, um, the idea that is familiar from certain East European political systems, above all Russia, that everything's a joke, that law is a joke, above all law is a joke, and that you're an idiot if you think anything else. In that particular attitude, that kind of pure cynicism, that cynicism which is so pure that it almost becomes a kind of naivete, um, that is unfortunately spreading in America. And that 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 idea, you know, the, the idea that it's all it's it's all a joke. It can't be real. You know, there must be some power play going on. There's a conspiracy theory which is going to explain all of this. That's related to these other factors, right? It's related to it's deeply related to the absence of local news. Um, it's deeply related to the experience of of, of radical of radical inequality. Um, so, and and it's also deeply related to the last social thing which I which I want to mention, which is the the inability to see a future, number four. So why would, what, so the Germans, um, you know, the, we were joking before several of the panelists or several, several of the colleagues speak, speak German and um, German actually does tend to have a word for everything, you know, even the words that, you know, and if it doesn't, you can make it up and people will nod and say, oh yes, that sounds like a word. It must be, it must, it must be a word. Like it, in, in English, you have to say there are no alternatives. In German, you can just say alternatives, Losigkeit. Um, in, in, in English, there's not a word for futurelessness, but that's the word that I want to use for my first, for my first point. You know, Zukunftslosigkeit. <laughs> the, the sense that, not the sense there isn't a future, but just forgetting that the future exists. Now, let me say, why is that so important for, before I get into it, why is that so important for the rule of law? Why does rule of law need, you know, to use a fancy word, why does the rule of law need a chronotope? Why does the rule of law need a timescape? And the answer is, it, you need a sense of the future for the rule of law, just like you need a sense of the future for democracy. Both of them are different ways of processing the past, you know, into a procedural moment in the present, which then generates predictable outcomes in the future. That's what, so law has a timeline. Law has a way of, law has a way of processing time for us. Um, it takes some controversial episode it ha that happened. It deals with it. In, in a court of law or in some other form of settlement, that's the present. And then that generates an outcome, right? A finding or a ruling, which then in some sense governs the future. But if without a sense of past, present, and future, without a, you know, a basically historical way of understanding time, it's hard to care about the law. And, and so this is, and by the way, that's true about democracy as well. Democracy is a way that, that you've got, there's, there's some controversy which has arisen from things that have happened in the past, but you have an election, that's the present, and then you generate a, you generate a future which presumably one can agree about. Um, so, the, 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 so the reason I worry so much about, about this, about the end of the future, is that I think the end of the future is a direct challenge to the ability of people to internalize a sense of the rule of law, or you, Shayla Boston's phrase again, um, the purpose of the law. The very word purpose assumes that there is a future. The word purpose aims at the future. So my, my fourth social concern, um, number four and the last one on my list of, of social challenges to the rule of law is, is this futurelessness. Where does it come from? Um, number one, it comes from the, the, the end of the American dream which is something that, you know, unfortunately, Mr. Trump was basically right about. People's expectations of doing better than future gen than generations past are, are, are basically kaput at this point. A second place it comes from is the pla our plateauing life expectancy. 
Uh, Amer Americans are living shorter lives than people in comparable countries. Our life expectancy peaked in 2014. Um, and if that seems like an abstraction to you, imagine that you were, you were born in 2002 or you were born in 2000, and now you're looking forward to a life which may be shorter than that of your parents and your grandparents. It's hard to think about the future in, in, in that situation. Um, our health crisis, not just the ongoing pandemic, but also the you know, now largely forgotten, but also ongoing opioid epidemic, make it very difficult for people to think about a future. We all know that we're spending all of our time negotiating the present now. And of course, there's also the threat of global warming, which everyone believes in. I mean, even the people who don't believe, even the people who say they don't believe in it, of course, believe in it. And whether you're trying to solve it or whether you're trying to just make as much money as you can before it arrives, either way, the global warming seems to threaten, seems to threaten the future. So I, I'm worried that in order to have the rule of law, you first have to have a sense that there's that there's a future. Okay, so conclusions. Um, I would like to think that the analysis suggests its own conclusions. That is to say that if 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 I'm vaguely right that some of these things are threats to the rule of law, that would mean that one would have to act directly on them in order to create an atmosphere which is favorable to the rule of law. That's that's my argument. So let me just close with a couple of thoughts about how, how things go wrong or how things can go further wrong. Um, the, th the three things that worry me the most in our, in our present are what I call in some, of, in some of my work, the politics of, of eternity. So when this futurelessness becomes permanent, when politics just becomes a kind of series of present emotions, um, when all we have in, in our timescape are references to a mythical past, um, uh, then I think we have, then we're dealing with a situation where law is going to be very difficult indeed, or the rule of law. A second thing which worries me based upon present developments is, um, is the leader principle, the, you know, which is the kind of the default human <laughs> expectation of politics that there's, that there's a leader. And the way this works is that, you know, if you have too much cynicism, it's easy for that cynicism to become faith. Um, if you don't believe that there's a future, it's very easy for you to be drawn into intense emotions about, about the present. And when law seems weak, then the appeal of a charismatic person can seem very strong. And then finally, um, the thing which is already upon us and which can get much worse is of course the, the politics of emergency. As, as I'm sure all of you will know, there was an extremely intelligent German lawyer called Karl Schmidt, one of the, one of the most intelligent Nazis, whose obsession was the exception. Uh, one of his basic ideas, as you will all know, is that the person the person who can make an exception is is the true is the true sovereign. And what we're seeing now, unfortunately, is a tendency which was evident in Weimar Germany before it became Nazi Germany, which is that little things which are on the edge of the law, which were meant to be exceptions, are now becoming the rule. So, for example, you know the the idea that you cannot prosecute a president. I mean, that was not ever meant to be a central feature of our system. That was meant to be a kind of detail for exceptional cases. And now it's, it's moving closer and closer to being a central feature of our system that you can't prosecute a president. It's certainly very important, I think, to how the president himself is thinking about, about the future. More generally, I'm worried about states of exception in the sense of declared states of exception in the, this autumn and, and later on. So the optimistic conclusion, the optimistic conclusion or the practical conclusion is that the, if, there, if, there are, if there are challenges in the era to the rule of law, then we have to not only embody and declare ourselves for the rule of law normatively and, and in our practice, but we also have to be able to address those challenges separately. I think all the challenges that I've addressed deserve, um, deserve attention in their own right. The case that I'm trying to make is that they're, they're connected also to, to the rule of law. I hope it's a case that you found interesting. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very, very much, Professor Snyder. Thank you very much for that uh, quite brilliant, quite disturbing uh, analysis. We, we do have some questions coming in. I encourage other people to um, submit them now on the Q&A bar at the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, <clears throat> Let me ask, um, while others are submitting theirs, let me ask you a kind of a threshold question. Uh, where does one begin? I mean, the, the array of problems that you have and, and sort of forces that you have identified is so uh, sweeping. Would you begin addressing the social challenges 
um, as a way of getting to the spatial and surface challenges. Um, or, or, but they're going to take quite some time to, to address. And uh, meanwhile, the spatial and surface challenges can get completely out of control. How, how would you prioritize, if you would, uh, a, a cohesive response to the, to the problems you've identified? Well, um, I mean, thanks, Stephen. You've you've uh, you you found you found a weak point in a presentation like this, um, <laughs> which is if you identify all the problems and you say that the problems suggest their own solutions, I should also be able to prioritize them. I, I but I actually think that's that in a way that's the, that's 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 the good news that they are in fact all 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 related. I would prioritize things which would have a a rapid positive knock on effect. So. If possible, I would think it's, you know, it would take a slightly different political setup than we have now, but you, we would get a lot of bang for the buck out of taxing social media and using that to support local reporting, um, however, however that is done. But that, that, could be, that could take place very quickly, and I think people's mental lives would be changed very rapidly if they just had access to local factuality again. Um, a second thing, which I'm, I may be an optimist about, is, is, is health. So one of the reasons people have trouble seeing the future is obviously not just the pandemic, but all of our, as it were, pre-existing conditions. Um, if people had decent access to healthcare in this country, there would be less fear and less anxiety and less negative emotion to work with if you're trying to, for example, create a state of emergency. And then, you know, global warming always sounds like it's like the demon that's in the background, but the, the, the positive side of that is that if you, and even if you don't solve global warming right away, which of course you're not gonna solve it right away, but the thing about global warming is that you can make declarations now about policy, which then relieve anxiety in, in, the, year, in the years to come. If you say, this is our target for that, this is our target for this, then you can create a decade or a quarter century, which is gonna be much calmer than the decade or quarter century was gonna be. So it's not about solving it, it's about saying, we have a solution, we know what we're going to do. There is going to be, there is going to be a future. So that's, that's three. I'm not sure those, those, that's exactly the right first three, but those are the three that come to mind. Thank you very much. Uh, a number of questions have come in. I'll, I'll read uh, as many as I can. Uh, uh, Hazel Weiser asks, uh, does the zone of lawlessness includes living as an African American in certain places throughout our history? Is, is that not the case? Yeah, ab absolutely. That's a that's a that's a central example. I mean, people people carry zones of exception with them, I mean, especially if they're African Americans and in a slightly different way as 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 immigrants. I think that's a that's a that's a very fair point, and it's essential to the whole concept um, because if conceptually we're trying to imagine the rule of law as something which is homogeneous so the, the corollary of equal protection for the law is that the space is, is, is homogeneous then then if we have exceptions which are connected to people because of the way they look or the color of their skin then we then we then we absolutely do not have that zone and um, it's of course connected to it, it, I mean, it, it's 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 connected to, to the daily treat the daily unequal treatment of people on the basis of race, but it's also connected to um, our incarceration system, which is a you know which is a walking, you know it's a, it's a it's a it's an obvious example of of inequality, which everyone on no matter what side they're on of it, everyone knows it's connected to race. It's a demonst it's a big public demonstration of racial politics that we have so many African Americans who are put in these particular kinds of zones. So. Um, I think that's a, that question is very well taken, and I think it's also it's, it's also a good example of a problem, hard as it is, that if it is addressed, then it starts to make other problems easier to address. So, for example, there's a clear relationship between American racial history and the ability, inability of Americans to have a sensible healthcare system. So, if you if you have the right conversation about race, you can also move into a conversation about health which ends up making everyone a little bit better off and then maybe a little bit calmer about politics and calmer about things like law and exception. Um, a, a second um, but related question relates to detention centers, um, uh, prisons, I assume, uh, and perhaps immigrant uh, migration uh, holding uh, pens. Um, isn't there a role for courts? Aren't they 
aren't they supervising the, at least the prisons? And in that sense, why are they lawless zones? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I'm sure there are, there are probably a thousand people watching and, you know, 50 people in this program who are better qualified to answer that question than I am. Uh, but I, I guess what I would do is I would say, let's, let's start from the ideal type lawless zone and then let's introduce the qualifications as necessary. So, uh, you know, a, a place where you can be held, um, a place where you're arrested, you know, without having your rights read, uh, a place where you can't make contact with lawyers, a place where lawmakers cannot actually visit except under certain specific conditions. Um, that's, you know, that's pushing us pretty, pushing the needle pretty far towards what I would call a lawless zone. And then if another, another way to think about it, you know, in, in daily practice is reports of violence and rape um, in these detention centers. So if you don't have the, you know, if your basic rights concerning your body are not being respected, if you're being beaten or you're being sexually abused, then that also for me would push the needle towards something like a lawless zone. I don't think they, sh I mean, to be clear, I don't think they should be lawless zones. I just think that, you know, in a dis that ideal, typically we have to have the notion of a lawless zone Ra rather than just, you know, going here, we have a rule of law state. Oops, you know, here's, here's something we're having an exception. I think it's important to have the ideal type of a lawless zone and start from that ideal type and see if there are things that maybe fit that ideal type a little bit. But of course, on the facts of the matter and what, what courts can actually do, I, I leave those questions to those who have expertise. Um, we now have a question uh, from Fred Lowenfels <clears throat> asking whether the situation in Portland isn't the Reichstag fire of today. So uh, that's obviously what I was trying to suggest. Um, that we, there, so on the one hand, it's, it's, it's very important for us to have that concept Reichstag fire because that concept of Reichstag fire reminds us that in a well-educated, in a well-educated population with a pretty impressive civil society and a hard hit, but still decent press, um, a single event, um, in a single event can push institutions which are already in, in a state of exception um, over the over the edge into something which is qualitatively different, a single event which is skillfully managed. I think it's very important that we have that category because that category applies to us. That said, um, I think this is a, you know, I think this is a slow motion Reichstag fire. I don't think Mr. Trump, I think Mr. I think in Mr. Trump's daily behavior, you see him striving for that perfect Reichstag fire thing. But, you know, whereas Whereas Hitler looked at the looked at the flames and and, this, and and understood this was his moment, Mr. Trump is striving to find that correct thing and also striving to find the correct words to say about it. And he's not, the opportunities aren't as good, and he's also not as good at and he doesn't work as hard. Um, he's not he's not as good at at, at formulating. But the, my basic answer is yes. That we are in a moment where uh, the the sitting president of the United States is. Uh, not just playing with, but um, I would say proposing that we treat the next election um, as, a, as an exceptional moment, which is more about regime than it is about uh, political party or the individual who's going, who's going to be elected. Um, the language that Mr. Trump uses, if you, you know, if you can follow it, it is strikingly similar to the kind of language which was used after the Reichstag fire. You know, the, the, the leftists and the anarchists and the socialists and the thugs, you know, that, that language is really strikingly similar. And the idea that the people on the left who are outside of power are in fact pulling all the strings, that was a dominant motif for Hitler. And, you know, the first victims after the Reichstag fire were actually socialists, um, members of the German Socialist Party. So the idea that even though the left is out of power, somehow the left is conspiratorially pulling all the strings and is responsible for disasters. That's an idea that we're also hearing right now. I mean, that was the Republican National Convention. Um, and that's also Mr. Trump's rhetoric about Portland. So he's not as good at it. The opportunities aren't as good. And we have the historical reference. But yes, I do think we're in a kind of slow motion, not very skillfully handled Reich Reichstag fire moment, and that we should act accordingly, which doesn't mean we should do the same things. As, as it doesn't mean we should imitate or repeat. It just means that 
we, we, as the whole spirit of this conference, I think, proposes, we, we have to actively, actively protect the rule of law and not just expect the rule of law to hold. And how, how can citizens do that? It's one thing to ask a local um, legislature to encourage um, communication within, within a, a city or a state, or it's another to ask Congress to tax the social media, the, the, the large technology companies in order to support newspapers. Um, but what can citizens do uh, and what can lawyers do other than litigating particular cases to slow down this, this uh, powerful force you're describing? Well, I think that the, the, the litigating particular cases is very important. Um, I, I know that there are preparations going on for, you know, the repetition of, of Bush v. Gore, which is, I think, very likely to happen and in, you know, slightly more dramatic circumstances. I think being ready legally um, for November this time around, you know, in 2016, I, I'm afraid we didn't much have the concept that there were you know, legally addressable things going on. Correct, I might be wrong about this, but this time, you know, plenty of colleagues uh, are make, are not only gaming things out, but are are preparing the legal briefs for the eventualities that can come. So that I mean, I, I wouldn't minimize the you know the filing the briefs, but the the second thing that that people can do is talk. Um, you know, it's a strange thing to be saying now because we're all on Zoom, but communicate with other people. Because even the, 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 the Reichstag fire scenario or the zone of exception, the, 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 the moment of exception scenario, the emergency politics scenario, depends upon a kind of downward spiral of paranoia where enough Americans think that enough other Americans are the enemy and have done something dramatically wrong. And so it's, it's particularly important now for people just to talk, um, to talk to people who are going to vote for Mr. Trump or whatever it might be, but just to kind of keep the whole thing humanized because otherwise, Otherwise, the president's version of events will, you know, has, has, has a greater chance of, of, of dominating. A third thing, and this is obvious, but and it goes back to the, the first question about, about African Americans. Um, if you're, you know, if you, if you want to vote, you have to be ready to protest. If you want to protest, you have to be ready to vote. Those two things go together. I mean, we have a right to vote, but a right is a right by definition, you know, to paraphrase Frederick Douglass, is something that you defend. It's something that you, it's something you struggle for. So, Americans can't do what we did in 2016, or for that matter, 2000, which is to just kind of lean back and think, well, you know, the, I, I voted, my, my job is done, let's just see how the, everyone else sorts it out. Let's just watch, you know, watch CNN and see what happens. People have to be ready to protest the next day, not violently, you know, not, you know, not aggressively, but people have to be ready to protest the next day. And, you know, protest until your votes are counted have slogans like count my vote or all votes count or whatever it is, and just make it make make everyone realize that they're not alone. Um, make the powers that be realize that there are there are actual human costs to be borne if they're going to try to if they're going to try to mess things up. Um, that you know being ready to protest I think is is probably probably the most important thing. Thank you very much. We we have quite a few more questions more than I think we're going to be able to get in. Um, uh, we have uh, one interesting question is, um, uh, what about the rule of law in situations where the law is simply bad? Yeah. Uh, uh, for example, the, the, the Fugitive Slave Act or apartheid. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a good question because it was, um, I mean, out of good manners, I, I didn't put that question to you, um, you know, because <laughs> I, I'm I'm working within the I'm working within the rule of law format here, but of course, um, you know the the doctrine of discovery is pretty bad law, but it's the base it's the basis of the existence of the United States. Um, you know the Indian treaties of eighteen you know eighteen thirty um, the 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 dis dispersion of the five civilized tribes you know whatever whatever the, the, all of the treaties that we violated with the Native Americans. Um, uh, that's that's bad law. I mean, there's an awful there's an awful lot of there's an awful lot of bad law, and that you know that would kind of be my point to you. Like that was my that's one of the arguments also that that's implicit in what I'm saying that the rule of law, you know, this idea of equality and equal protection, and this idea that we all you know come under the law has to inform 
lawmaking itself, right? The rule of law that you're talking about, you know, is is, is a normative idea more than it's a positive idea. But um, I, I do have a kind of an answer, which is that insofar as we accept that the rule of law is a normative and not just a positive idea, then the, the notion of bad law can be answered with the notion of, of, of good law. Or to put it more broadly, I don't think, and this goes to my point about the future too, I don't think we can do without ethics. You know, I don't think we can do without explicit ethical conversation, which has been unfortunately kind of hibernating in American life recently. You know, a lot of what's supposed to be ethical conversation is farmed out to the market. You know, the market's going to decide for us. Um, uh, a lot of ethical conversation is farmed out to our emotions. You know, this is how I feel very strongly right now. You've got to respect it. You've got to listen to it. But I, I think we can't actually build back out the future without a sense of what the future should be. So I, I would just, that's how I would answer it. I don't think the issue of bad law is a problem per se, because we can answer with, we, we, can, we can say that this is an ethical conversation that we're having. Professor Snyder, let me thank you. There are many more people who have questions and we could probably take all of your time and much of um, uh, the rest of our forum, but your analysis is trenchant, disturbing, um, and very enlightening. Um, and in that well, sense, it's been very helpful to us. And I want to thank you on behalf of all of us for your spending the time today. And if you'd like to give us a parting, a parting um, dose of wisdom, that would be great. <laughs> but well, otherwise, I, 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 mean, I, 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 I let me give you a parting, a parting dose of, of, of gratitude. I appreciate being included in, in, in the gathering and, and in this panel. Um, and the spirit of the spirit of all I, I've been saying is is a spirit of recovery. I, I don't I don't think I, I, if the problem can be diagnosed, I think that it can be solved. And uh, m much as it's tempting and necessary to dwell on the you know, almost inevitable chaos of November and December, I think the country is at a tipping point where things could go much worse. But also, if we if we if we're thinking ahead a little bit, where things can also get much much better very quickly. So. That, that's my that's my parting note of hope. Thank you very much, Stephen. I'm very glad that okay. I could take part. Thank you very, very much on behalf of all of us. And thank you for spending the time in Vienna with us. Thank you. It is, it is now my pleasure to um, uh, introduce uh, to our gathering, uh, Professor Cass Sunstein from Harvard, who I think has just joined us. Hello, Professor. Um, and um, let me not, waste his time with an extensive in introduction, but let me just say to you that uh, we're very fortunate to have Professor Sunstein with us. He is currently the uh, Robert Walmsley Pro University Professor at Harvard, and is the founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy at Harvard Law School. He, he is a recipient of the Holberg Prize from the government of Norway. <clears throat> Uh, roughly the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Law and Humanities, uh, and is um, an advisor to the World Health Organization uh, with respect to its um, behavioral insights and sciences for health. Uh, from 2009 to 2012, he served in the White House um, as the uh, administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. He also served as the, on the President's Review Board on Intelligence and Communications. He's written many more articles and books than one can begin to list, hundreds of them. Um, um, and three recent books that you, some of you may have seen uh, are uh, Impeachment, A Citizen's Guide uh, in 2017, On Freedom in 2019, uh, and uh, uh, a, a 2019 book uh, called Change, How Change Happens as well as a book this year on too much information. I think something that we can all recognize. Uh, we are very privileged to have him here. I think he, Professor Sunstein is widely regarded as America's leading expert on legal aspects of the administrative state, if, if that could be called that. And I know that he is, uh, he's writing a new book on uh, or involved in new projects involving that as well. So thank you, Professor Sunstein, for, for joining us and the floor is yours. 
Okay, great. It's an honor to be here and I'm struck by the enormity of the occasion and the largeness of our topic and uh, that makes it even more of an honor to be able to talk to you. Uh, so I should say what I'm going to talk about is a book that actually came out today. Uh, today is its birthday. It's called Law and Leviathan and it's about the rule of law. And while what I'm going to be exploring is um, we hope Adrian Vermeule, my co-author, and I hope uh, is about timeless themes and about uh, the United States and also uh, Russia and China and South Africa and Germany. Uh, it's also particularly focused on and grows out of the current moment. So with respect to the United States, more than at any time since the 1930s, uh, the administrative state is under assault. Uh, four justices and possibly five want to reinvigorate the non-delegation doctrine, which in their hands would raise serious questions. I think this is very clear about the Federal Communications Act and about the Occupational Safety and Health Act. It might also raise serious doubts about the Clean Air Act and the uh, Motor Vehicle Safety Act and uh, numerous others. Uh, there's also great interest in uh, uh, eliminating the whole idea of independent regulatory agencies, which would put the Federal Reserve Board in deep jeopardy, uh, it would raise questions, serious questions about the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The FCC and the FTC might come under a kind of constitutional knife and all that it might have seemed like crazy talk uh, as recently as eight years ago, but given the holding and the analysis in the Consumer Bureau case, it's, it's no longer uh, the stuff of science fiction. Um, Chevron, of course, which is a uh, grant of law interpreting power to agencies, and our, which is a grant of law interpreting, of regulation interpreting power to agencies. These are both under considerable pressure and no one should be amazed if Chevron is um, destroyed in the, in the next years. Uh, if we put the various pieces together, a large scale constitutional assault on the administrative state, uh, we're not seeing the specter of it, we're seeing it. And what will happen with it is unclear, but uh, it's moving, it's, it's in motion. Okay, there are four concerns here. So what I'm going to do is describe the concerns and then talk about the rule of law. Uh, one concern is about liberty and freedom. And you can see this from the standpoint of those who think of the Environmental Protection Agency or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration as a kind of specter of something that is un-American, a kind of constitutional barnacle, insofar as people aren't allowed to go about their business, and I choose that word advisedly, in the way that they might otherwise be. Uh, the second idea is not about liberty, but about self-government. And here the notion is that regulators and administrators aren't directly accountable to the people. In one form, the word deep state is a shorthand for this. And the thought is that the administrators are jeopardizing what the American Revolution was fought for. And I'm speaking from Concord, Massachusetts, and actually a house that played a role in the American Revolution. So very alert to the passionate nature of a claim that the ideals behind the American Revolution are now jeopardized. In addition to an idea about liberty and an idea about self-government, self uh, there's an idea about the specter of authoritarianism. And when uh, President Trump's advisor, one of them, uh, who's in legal trouble now, referred to the deconstruction of the administrative state. At least many people heard him as calling up Roscoe Pound's old idea from the 1930s and 40s that the administrative state isn't merely undemocratic. It's raising uh, the possibility of something very foreign to American traditions. And the fourth idea is just uh, law it says that this is a constitutional atrocity, uh, this apparatus, the regulatory state, and uh, the atrocity has to be eliminated, like most atrocities. Uh, Justice Gorsuch, I think, thinks something like that with respect to dis discretion wielding agencies, and several of the other justices think this with respect to the uh, independent regulatory agencies. Okay, I think it's productive and charitable 
to look at these objections in the most sympathetic light and to see them as recognizing the importance of three values, which are liberty, the first, uh, accountability, which captures several of them, and equal treatment. So those are three ideas that deserve appeal across uh, diverse lines. A good way to promote these values, this is the affirmative suggestion, is not by deconstructing or destroying anything and not by engrafting contemporary anxieties onto the Constitution. And my view is that many of the claims about the original meaning of the Constitution actually are emphatically contemporary anxieties. They're not speaking for Alexander Hamilton or James Madison. But the concerns about accountability and liberty and more recently equal treatment, those are constitutional ideals. And the notion of the rule of law is a road in. And I wanna say that when I first taught in a classroom uh, what I'm about to speak about, which is Law and Fuller's ideas about the rule of law. It was in China in the 1980s. And I taught this material thinking that it was kind of background before we got to administrative law, but it was as if it was uh, for that classroom in that hour, uh, a magical moment, a moment where there were lights that were shining and something had entered the room that was almost spiritual speaking in China about not the rule of idea in the abstract, but the specific ideas I'm going to talk about now. And the, the reason for the uh, spiritual feeling in the room, I think is connected with the uh, hoped for contemporary resonance of the ideas which I'm going to uh, sketch and their relevance to Americans everywhere, whatever their political affiliation, and however much money or little money they have and whatever their health. Okay, so for what Fuller emphasized was an imaginary king named Rex, good name for a king, who was trying to create a legal system. And Rex, in Fuller's view, repeatedly failed. And he told this as a story with a narrative, not as an analysis, where Rex tried to make a legal system and it didn't work. And then he went back and it didn't work again. And then he went back and it failed and he kept failing. Okay, each of the narratives is about one failure and I'm gonna describe the eight. Apologies for the fact that it's not three, that would be preferable, but it is eight. And each of them bears on contemporary administrative law. The first is a failure to make rules in the first place, ensuring that all issues are decided on a case by case basis. And that is a way of not having the rule of law if we have an administrator who has nothing, not merely no direction from Congress, but nothing against which to decide whether someone gets benefits, say, or someone's denied a license. The second is a failure of transparency in the sense that people aren't aware of the rules with which they have to comply. I might say in my experience as a kind of uh, regulatory something in the White House, I heard from the private sector in the US probably more from than anything. We just don't know what you want us to do. There's a failure of transparency, help. The third is an abuse of retroactivity in the sense that people can't rely on current rules and under, and under threat of change. The idea of an anti-retroactivity principle which the Supreme Court has kind of been grafted onto the administrative state, has played a significant role in cases in which the Trump administration had lost in court. The fourth is a failure to make rules understandable, and we lawyers are all well aware of cases in which the administrative state doesn't do that, doesn't make the rules understandable. The fifth, fifth failure is rules that contradict each other, the sixth is rules that require people that they're powerless to comply with. They just can't. Think of some tax laws, maybe. The seventh is changes in the rules which are so rapid and so uh, confusing that people can't act in accordance with them. And the eighth, and I think the most gripping, is a mismatch between the rules and, as announced and the rules as administered. 
Okay, Fuller was writing against the background set by fascism and communism, but he had the United States in his view screen. And his claim was that if a legal system violates any one of these ideas, it is to that extent failing to have a legal system at all, except perhaps in the Pickwickian sense in which a void contract can still be said to be one kind of contract. So his claim was that law has an internal morality that reflects the distinctive moral values that are associated with the rule of the law itself. Now, I'm acutely aware of the diversity of people who are listening to this session. And whether you practice environmental law or occupational safety law or anti-discrimination law, you have almost certainly seen one or another of these failures of the rule of law. Now, these failures aren't every failure. You can have a society that complies with the rule of law that isn't democratic. You could have a society that complies with the rule of law that doesn't have freedom of religion. You can certainly have a society that complies with the rule of law that doesn't have free markets. But still, the values of associated with, associated with the rule of law, while not comprehensive, only part of what we want, they're really important. And our ability to isolate them is kind of an advance because then we can know what kind of failure, failure we're having. Okay, the plea is that if the president's name begins with T or O or B, an insistence on law's, law's morality is an excellent way of making more effective the operation of the regulatory state. So it's an efficaciousness promoting thing to do and of responding sympathetically and charitably to the strongest arguments of those who want to take the administrative state away. So we can see cases where the rules are changing so quick. It might involve DACA. It might involve environmental policy. It might involve fuel economy regulations imposed on automobile companies. These failures are ones in which the private sector is legitimately concerned that there's a rule of law problem. It might be that the criminal justice system on the ground is just really different from the criminal justice system as announced. And that's a problem for the rule of law. It might be that immigrants are subject to a regime of law which is not what the rules on the books say. And that's a really serious problem. And my plea is that the rule of law so understood is not just a, um, a set of aspirations in the sky or bush bookish stuff, but is a real world project that's like a boat that we have to continue to build and that occasionally leaks. In some high profile cases, and I'm just going to mention a couple, where the Trump administration has lost in the Supreme Court, to the surprise of many observers, it hasn't been because, you know, there are four people appointed by Democratic presidents and one who is maybe in some respects a moderate, though appointed by a Republican. It's because the court has been schooled either explicitly in the ideas just described or lawyers develop intuitions of the sort just described. In June of this year, in striking down the repeal of the DACA program, where the Trump administration took away Obama's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, the court emphasized very much an apparent abuse of retroactivity. The court said that hundreds of thousands of people had done and this is very vivid, real stuff being brought to bear in vindication of the rule of law. They had enrolled in degree programs, started businesses, began their careers, and bought houses depending on the program. When the administration eliminated the program, it didn't say a word about the reliance interests. And the plea that reliance interests have to be taken into account is a straightforward incorporation of the concern of, about the abuse of retroactivity that Fuller called out as a way of not having a legal system at all. This part of the opinion, while it's emphasizing human consequences, it's inspiring in part because it's making real a promise 
that you might say the due process clause points to, but which the real kind of on the ground world of administrative law is developing. It's making that uh, part of the fabric of administra American, American administrative law. Or consider the ruling in June about a year, a few months ago, striking down the decision to add a citizenship question to the US cen census. When the court did that, its key word was that the justification for adding the census question, which pointed to enforcement of the Voting Rights Act, was pretextual. It was made up for the occasion, not the real basis for the government's decision, which suggests the world of law is not consistent with the, uh, the laws announced is not consistent with the law as, defend, as, as developed. And that's a problem for the rule of law. Okay, if we look through the Roberts court and the lower courts at their best under President Trump, I think more visibly than under President Obama, but both, the courts have been developing on the fly in some ways, uh, an elaboration of the morality of administrative law. So this is the claim, not the morality of law, morality of administrative law. The courts have repeatedly emphasized the importance of reliance interests and so worked to combat unduly rapid changes in the law. The courts have emphasized that agencies have to follow their own rules. You know that old principle, the Accardi principle, reducing the risk that agencies will make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. This isn't the heavy artillery and I think the nuclearness of the non-delegation doctrine, but it is a rule of law principle that does the same work in a much more low key way. Agencies have to follow their own rules. Protecting against failures of transparency, courts have said that rules have to be outgrowths, logical outgrowths of proposed rules. This is technical stuff with a rule of law component. Okay, these rules have led to numerous defeats for political actors in Republican and Democratic administrations. The rule of law in the United States isn't consistent with, let's say, its highest and best self, but it is safeguarding every day the distinctive values associated with the rule of law. Uh, the suggestion is that the nuclearness of the constitutional assault on the administrative state is actually a betrayal rather than a vindication of the values of liberty, accountability, self-government, and constitutional fidelity. To protect health and safety, to protect rights, to protect freedom itself, to reduce the risk of mortality, as we're seeing very visibly, any advanced nation needs a strong administrative state. It's not public enemy number one. But any such nation needs something else also. It needs the rule of law. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Sunstein. Um, Quite a few questions have come in, not surprisingly. Uh, and uh, before I, I uh, sort them, um, let me just ask you uh, a more general one. The courts have done surprisingly well in reviewing the changes uh, that the Trump administration has made. Uh, and you've indicated some of the important uh, decisions, but the agencies uh, seem to have done surprisingly poorly and uh, repeatedly apparently abandoning their principles, their purposes, their statutes uh, to accommodate uh, White House pressures and political objectives, including even in the health field. Uh, how can that be addressed in your view? It's a great question and I feel to get clarity on it, I'd want a lot of details. So let me talk about three categories. Uh, there are categories of cases that don't hit the headlines where the regulators have uh, either been permitted to or have somehow insisted on fidelity to law and science. So 
uh, this may be a little technical, but the National Ambient Air Quality Standards are an important part of the Clean Air Act. They are the basic rules of how clean the air has to be. And I think President Trump made a campaign promise that he was going to uh, get rid of the Obama ozone regulation, and he didn't. So the Obama ozone regulation has been uh, steady. Uh, for particulate matter, which is a particularly bad, so to speak, yeah, forgive me, air pollutant, uh, the Trump administration hasn't weakened the standard. Um, the rules involve with automobile safety, um, including cameras or compulsory in cars, uh, the nutrition facts panel as Obama redesigned, uh, both of these have been reaffirmed. So there's a lot of cases of things that were done by Bush or Obama or Clinton, where the regulators have convinced everyone uh, this, is, this is the right thing to do and no scale back. Then there's a second category, as you point to, where the administration has overreached as a matter of law, been unfaithful to law, and courts have stepped in. Then there's a third category, which is, I think, what concerns you, where either the regulators on their own hook have violated statutes or acted arbitrarily, or where the White House apparatus has kind of pushed in that direction. And the only remedy for that, I think, is uh, the rule of law through judicial review. And having worked in the White House, I'm very alert to the fact that it's slow and episodic. So it's, it's really imperfect. It's great. Uh, thank goodness for it. But if you have an administration that does something illegal uh, with respect to a, you know, repealing a regulation in October of 2020, uh, if, if it's not fixed internally, it's going to take a long time for it to get fixed. Thank you. Uh, Robert Cusimano has asked uh, uh, the following question. Professor Snyder mentioned the absence of fidelity to facts is a major factor undermining the rule of law. Are the APA procedures designed to assure sufficient factual and scientific fidelity? Uh, and are they working any better? And I'm puzzling over the claim that violation of facts or poor fact finding is a violation of rule of law. And I'm kind of stuck in the little morality administrative framework and it doesn't make the list, but it's certainly bad. Let's just say it's bad. And it, it might be a violation of some law and to that extent, a violation of the rule of law. So if we're talking about a formal proceeding, the meaning on the record rulemaking, which is rare, or on the record adjudication, which is common, the substantial evidence test is the standard for judicial review of um, fact finding. And it's not that deferential. So agencies lose a significant amount of the time uh, at, by one count, about 30%. Um, uh, arbitrary or capricious is the standard for judicial review of agency fact-finding and rulemaking, and agencies lose non-trivially there also. It's tricky uh, because suppose the agency says something about, you know, whether a carcinogen imposes a serious risk. It might be really technical, or suppose that the NLRB is making a factual claim about whether the employer or the employee is lying about the reason for discharge, that might turn on issues of credibility where the court would be reluctant to intervene. But I'll give you one example where the presence of judicial review might well have played a role, at least by newspaper reports, and who knows if they're true. The Trump administration had people who wanted to eliminate the Obama administration's finding that climate change endangers uh, uh, public health and welfare called the endangerment finding. And, uh, you know, there are people who would have liked to have done that, it, it seems, but that wouldn't have held up in court. That would have been a, a really rapid loss and probably that people knew that and so they didn't try it. That leads to another question um, from a number of our, of our people in the audience. Um, the Supreme Court sometimes has, has decided things on APA grounds of the sort you've described, um, <clears throat> while avoiding constitutional questions, particularly in the DACA case, for example. And do you think they were, uh, the court was right to do that? And do you think that that is a, um, uh, the administrative review process uh, is a more 
useful way to discipline uh, errant um, agencies than constitutional review? It's a great question. Uh, I have a kind of really lawyerly way of thinking about it, which means it's not going to be, it's going to be very mundane, which is that if an administrative agency has said, let's say, not to have gone through notice and comment before it did something, that doesn't raise a constitutional problem, it raises an APA problem. Uh, if an agency is said to have intruded on people's property rights, so taking that's a you know that's a Fifth Amendment problem. It's not an APA problem. So the question is what the agency did. In the DACA case, the claim that there was an APA violation, in my view, was extremely powerful, and the claim that there was a constitutional violation, uh, much less so. But that all depends on one's view about the particular issue. So which is a better basis for decision depends on which is stronger. Uh, you could have a case where, let's say, there's an administrator who has, under Chevron, interpret a statute in a way that raises a very serious constitutional question. And the court's option could be either go the administrative law route and say, we won't interpret the statute so as to raise the serious question, or to go the constitutional route and just say, OK, the agency gets Chevron deference, but it violated, let's say, the, the First Amendment. I would prefer the former on the ground that uh, it's a more cautious and modest judicial role to find a statutory violation than to haul out the constitutional artillery. And it also has a kind of uh, non-delegation doctrine feel in a way that isn't nuclear in a bad way. Meaning it says if, if an agency is going to run up against free speech rights, Congress had better clearly authorize it and agencies shouldn't be doing that on the basis of some ambiguous provision in you know, some, some statute. Um, what suggestions, if any, would you have to um, assure better protection for, agents, for agency employees who seek to resist a political uh, drift in the decision-making process perhaps to the disadvantage of the beneficiaries of the, of the rule that the agency is administering? Okay, that's also a great question. So um, first we have to think about political. Uh, so suppose the Biden administration comes to exist and it says, you know, we have some values with respect to civil rights that are different from the values of our prior with the prior administration and with respect to, let's say, transgender or sexual orientation, we're going to take a different approach. And some of the Trump administration civil servants really don't like that. Uh, that's a legitimate, so long as it's consistent with law, that's a legitimate use of political values. So to press the administrative state in one or another direction, even if it's based on values, that's okay. Uh, if the, you know, the Biden or Trump administration says we have some political values here about the environment and we don't really care about the science, we're going to follow the values, that's, that's a real problem. And uh, the, the best protection, I guess, for the civil servants is uh, a legal protection against reprisal for legitimate, let's say, use of science and um, uh, uh, law and also a, uh, a culture, and this is harder maybe, to create a culture where disagreement is welcome. So I'll just tell you a story, shall I? When, when I came into the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, I was um, following someone under President Bush who had a very different view of certain issues, not everyone. And there was someone in my office, a civil servant, who thought, I, I won't specify the issue, but on a very important set of issues thought that President Bush had it right and the Obama view was completely wrong. And he was great and he pressed me really hard and he was very unhappy with me on certain issues and completely bless him. Because while in the end I disagreed with him, the analysis and conclusions were much better 
because of his disagreement. And I wouldn't describe his disagreement as political. It, dep it was about policy and economics. Um, and I didn't override him on political grounds. Uh, it was, you know, I was, I was, happened to be his boss, but it was on grounds of policy. And he thought that was okay, it was a mistake, but any reprisal against him would have been unthinkable. He was doing his job. That's not a culture that is strongly evident at the moment, is it? Well, I'm not there, but I agree with you that uh, what we're observing is not seeing a, a welcoming of, ooh, there's a potential spam call, or maybe it's a call from the White House responding particularly be. to your question. So I think you know, the, the federal government is a very diverse operation, and I'm sure we're seeing in some circumstances, stuff that, stuff that is uh, quite terrible, and in some circumstances, things that, that aren't so terrible. Well, thank you very much. I see that you are on call, quite literally, and, and that you're a very capable ministry assistant is trying to reach you. So uh, thank you very much for spending the time with us. Um, and there were many more questions that um, are up on the screen that you, you've been spared. But thank you for sharing your thoughts and your, your wonderful experience in this area. Thank you. It was a great honor. Thanks, everybody. And uh, hooray for members of the bar uh, <laughs> 2020. Thank you, Professor. Well, it is um, uh, um, my pleasure now to introduce um, our next speaker, whom many of you have, may have seen uh, on one or more of her uh, television appearances, where she is a valued commentator and always calls them straight and as she sees them. Joyce Vance is a professor, um, a distinguished professor of practice of law at um, Alabama Law School. Uh, she was previously the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama. Um, and she had worked for 25 years before that at the Department of Justice uh, both as a, in the criminal field and as the, the appellate chief. Uh, uh, she uh, began her career uh, in Washington at a firm called the Aaron Fox, Kittner, Plotkin and Kahn. I don't know if they're still around. I, I remember them well. And uh, she's graduated the University of Virginia Law School and Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. Uh, and she is going to talk to us today about the Justice Department uh, and other uh, law enforcement agencies within the United States and their relationship to uh, the courts, uh, the agencies, and to Congress. And she'll do that, such blend of that as she thinks is appropriate. Thank you, Joyce. I look forward to hearing your views. Um, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be with you and with members of the New York Bar and others. And I have to say it's sort of a nightmare to have to follow Tim Snyder uh, and Cass Sunstein, but I'll try to soldier on. The one thing that's certain when you talk about the Justice Department these days, uh, any talk that you give will be out of date in a few days, if not later that evening. And nonetheless, that's my job to try to talk with you about DOJ in this moment, in this era, where things seem to be changing so rapidly. DOJ has been in the news ever since the first few weeks of this presidency when Acting Attorney General Sally Yates was fired, followed by FBI Director Jim Comey being fired later. There's been a steady drumbeat ever since. A and things seem to be moving even faster now. It's sort of like we're being drawn into a maelstrom and, and perhaps we are as the election approaches. But many people have questioned whether DOJ is strong enough to survive. And so let's talk in, in detail about the challenges it faces. I'll be perhaps less theoretical than the earlier speakers and get down a little bit more in the weeds and talk about some of the facts, some of the events that we've all lived through in these last three and a half years and what they portend for our system of justice. So let's start by asking, what would it mean to the country if our rule of law system broke? If, if it just simply was absent from our lives. At bottom, that would mean having a criminal justice system that wasn't an effort to find the truth, 
and resolve cases based on the facts and the law. It would mean having a system that was not independent of the president and his political power, but rather was a tool in the president's arsenal, one that they could wield for either personal or for political advantage. It would mean having a criminal justice system where presidents could benefit their friends with declined investigations, dismissed cases, beneficial sentencing recommendations, and lenient, lenient treatment. It would also mean having a president who could use the criminal justice system to punish perceived enemies, targeting them for unwarranted prosecutions or, quote, locking them up to retaliate for political or personal enmity at the expense of due process rights. And, and worst case, we would end up with a new norm in our country, with a presidency that's above the law, that can manipulate the criminal justice system to respond to its whims. The perception among our people would be that the system was unfair. We heard Professor Snyder talk a bit about that Russian mentality seeping into our country. And that would ultimately be very danger, dangerous for our system because as with so much in life, perception has a way of becoming reality. And the impartial pursuit of justice ultimately could end up on life support, if not dead, if we permitted things to go too far. That's obviously not an outcome that any of us want. But one thing we have to face here is that a good outcome, an intact rule of law system of government is not guaranteed. If we're being intellectually honest in response to the press of events during this administration, the deluge of scandals, near constitutional crises that have come with such frequency, and the significance of them, it's virtually impossible to keep track of all of them. There's been so much. We have to acknowledge that we can't paint with certainty a rosy picture of the future, at least not simply based on long-standing faith in the strength of institutions that form the architecture for our democracy. We are in fact at a critical point in our country's history where it's going to require hard work on all of our parts to rebuild and strengthen the institutions. So talking about DOJ, I think it's important for me to tell you that I have strong faith in the people and the traditions at the Justice Department. All administrations face challenges and, and there are missteps that have to be dealt with. And there have been some fairly serious challenges. In, in my lived experience at DOJ, we went through the US attorney firings during the George W. Bush administration, which turned out to be motivated in part by political reasonings. There were deep concerns. DOJ worked through that, it emerged, it survived. But the challenges that we face today are of an entirely different magnitude. And that brings us to Attorney General William Barr, who came to the role of Attorney General a year and seven months ago. Uh, he came to the job after circulating a 19-page memo that happened to get to the White House and DOJ, and in which he promised in advance of being selected for the job that a president couldn't get prosecuted on his watch, not even for obstruction of justice. So one of his first official acts in office, as I'm sure everyone remembers, was misrepresenting, at best, the conclusions reached by Bob Mueller during his investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. And Barr got it so wrong in his summary of the report before it was released to the public, that even the perpetually taciturn Mueller felt obligated to reach out and, and correct Barr in a letter. Afterwards, Judge Reggie B. Walton subsequently said in a case brought by a media outlet, BuzzFeed, uh, seeking an unredacted version of the report under the Freedom of Information Act, the following about the sitting Attorney General of the United States. After reviewing the record in that case, the request for the full report, the redactions, and some of the surrounding testimony that, that was put forth, uh, Walton said that Mr. Barr put forward a, quote, distorted and misleading account of the report's findings, and that he lacked credibility on the topic. Judge Walton said that the Attorney General could not be trusted, citing, quote, inconsistencies between the Attorney General's statements about the report when it was secret 
and its actual contents that turned out to be more damaging to President Trump. And finally, Judge Walton said that Mr. Barr's lack of candor called into question his credibility and in turn the department's assurances to the court. This one vignette alone from Barr's tenure as Attorney General is shocking, and it would have likely led to the resignation of any other Attorney General. This Attorney General continues to be celebrated by his boss. And so here we are at this juncture asking, what is the future of the rule of law and the Justice Department when that sort of conduct is tolerated and even applauded? How do we assess where we're, where we're headed? So here's my spoiler alert. To state the obvious, our system is under attack. But my belief is that its survival and restoration can be facilitated, and, and in fact, it might depend upon lawyers like us. We're not just advocates for our clients. At our best, we should be community advocates for the rule of law. And all of us should, should consider ourselves to be community advocates, no matter what kind of law we practice, where we live, or what our politics are. This is a matter that is above politics. It is a matter about the fundamental architecture of our form of government. So we should be helping our communities understand why it's so important to have a rule of law, which in shorthand I would say means a set of rules that are publicly known in advance and that are applied fairly and equally to everyone, regardless of who they are and who they know. It is important for us to acknowledge in any discussion about the rule of law that it's imperfect, that our goal of a fair and just society is still aspirational, as events this summer have shown us so clearly um, in such bright focus. So this makes it more urgent, not less, that we as lawyers consider ourselves to be lawyers for the Constitution. We need to keep bending the moral arc of the universe towards justice. What happens if we as lawyers don't support the work of the Justice Department and the role of the rule of law in our form of government? I will use a very crude analogy that I often offer my students in my Democratic Institutions seminar. My husband and I like to play hearts with our four best friends, or at least we used to before COVID. So if you don't play, here's how the game of hearts works. One game consists of many separate hands. And although we're good friends, we fight like crazy to win each hand. Here's the problem. If you get so tied up in winning one hand that you're willing to break the rules to get there, for instance, there's a rule in hearts that you can't take a card back off the table after you've played it. But if you realize you've made a fatal mistake and you really want to win the hand and you insist on breaking the rules, if you're willing to go so far that you'll burn the whole game down just to win one hand, then there won't be any game left to play at all. And that's what we face right now. We have a crew that's so intent on winning this hand, holding on to power, that they're willing to do just about anything to stay there. And it's up to us as lawyers to set boundaries, to make sure that the rules stay in place, and very importantly, to make sure that we bring communities and our fellow citizens along with us so that they understand what's at stake and what the rules need to be going forward. So let me tell you a story that you're probably familiar with to set the context for this. Roger Stone, longtime friend and political advisor to President Trump, a man who has Richard Nixon tattooed on his back, was indicted in January of 2019 by special counsel Robert Mueller on one count of obstruction of justice five counts of false statements and one count of witness tampering. Stone denied the charges and pleaded guilty. On November 15, 2019, a jury in the, Grand, a jury in the District of Columbia convicted Stone on all charges. He became the sixth Trump aide or advisor convicted by the Mueller team. In February of 2020, federal prosecutors recommended that Stone be sentenced to as much as nine years in prison. Shortly after they made that recommendation, the president tweeted that it amounted to an impermissible miscarriage of justice. Senior officials at DOJ appeared to respond. The following day, they withdrew the initial sentencing recommendation, something that simply doesn't happen, and filed a new one, 
asking for a shorter sentence. Now, the Attorney General denied that the Justice Department's change of heart had anything to do with the President's wishes, but the President tweeted his thanks for the sec second sentencing recommendation to Barr. He said, congratulations to Attorney General Bill Barr for taking charge of a case that was totally out of control and perhaps should not even have been brought. Four senior prosecutors resigned from the Stone case and one left the department entirely. This subversion of the Justice Department would have been shocking in any other presidency, but by February of 2020, it was almost predictable, as was President Trump's commutation of Stone's sentence, just days before he would have been required to report to begin service of his prison sentence. It is difficult, if not impossible, on these facts to avoid the conclusion that improper political influence was brought to bear by the White House on the conduct of a criminal case involving a buddy of the president's, and still worse, that officials at DOJ permitted that influence to impact their work. But there's a hero in our story. Aaron Zelensky, an assistant United States attorney in the District of Maryland and a member of the prosecution team for Stone, came forward and testified as a whistleblower before Congress. He explained that in his judgment, the United States attorney for the District of Columbia, where the Stone case was being prosecuted, had succumbed to political pressure and that Stone was being treated differently from any other defendant because of his relationship to the president. In other words, the truth came to light. Lawyers who stand up can make a difference. As you all know, the Stone case is not the only reason for concern about what's going on at DOJ. There are others. The prosecution against Mike Flynn, Trump's first national security director for lying to the FBI was dismissed, a move led by the attorney general, even though Flynn had twice pleaded guilty under oath. Paul Manafort, the president's former campaign manager, was released early from prison under COVID release guidelines, even though he didn't meet them. And Michael Cohen, the president's former lawyer and subject of the indictment where the president himself was identified as individual number one, was returned to prison after he was properly released when he refused to renounce his intention to write a book about Trump. More recently, there have been concerns about the Durham investigation, a look into the origins of the Russia investigation during the Obama administration, even though the inspector general at DOJ has already fully investigated and reported that nothing criminal occurred. But Attorney General Barr engaged the U.S. Attorney in Connecticut, John Durham, to do a second look. And uh, earlier this week, I guess late last week now, a, a prosecutor who came back from private practice who rejoined DOJ to be involved in that investigation, Nora Danahy, resigned. There are concerns Durham is being pressured to achieve results before the election. And Barr has signaled an intention to release an interim report in that case ahead of the election, which I have to tell you, there are no such things as interim reports in prosecution. E either you indict or you don't. And it's hard to view this as anything other than a political stunt meant to influence the election. There's obviously more conduct by this attorney general. Barr gave the order to clear peaceful protesters from Lafayette Park ahead of President Trump's walk from St. John's, uh, or rather to St. John's Church from the White House for a photo op. Barr lied about the firing of the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, and then he tried to laugh it off when questioned about it before the House Judiciary Committee. Recently, he's disingenuously claimed after Trump encouraged North Carolina voters to vote twice in November that he did not know state law, did not know whether it was illegal to vote more than once in an election for president. So that's a lot. And what else will happen between now and the election and thereafter is impossible to predict. But we have to somehow try to keep our minds around this almost overwhelming deluge of facts, any one of which would likely have provoked great outcry in any other administration, conduct that's unseemly and really unthinkable for an attorney general, except that now it seems to happen with regularity. 
increasingly it's difficult to escape the inference that Barr is using the resources of the Justice Department in Trump's battle for re-election. And why would that be a problem? You don't have to take my word for it because we actually have Bill Barr's explanation of why that would be a problem. He explained why it would be troubling for the department to, quote, get tangled up in election politics, as Texas Senator John Cornyn put it at Barr's confirmation hearing when he asked Barr why DOJ's investigations should be insulated from elections. Barr's response was this, because the incumbent party has their hands on the levers of the law enforcement apparatus of the country, and you do not want it used against the opposing political party. He, of course, is correct, and that should apply whether a Democrat or a Republican is sitting in the White House. The tradition, policies, and culture of DOJ are specifically designed to prevent against political interference in cases. And I continue to believe that they are strong enough to be reset if we do that in a deliberate and intentional way, a way designed to restore confidence in the institution, because uh, make no mistake about it, there's serious damage done when a president deliberately sows doubt about the conduct of federal law enforcement and federal prosecutors, as, as Trump has done throughout his tenure. The Justice Department's moral compass has always been its career prosecutors, and they've continued to demonstrate their dedication to integrity. We will need legislation and formal steps to restore the department's independence and integrity. It will no longer be enough to have unwritten practices and traditions. And fortunately, there are a lot of smart people already at work formulating what that might look like. For instance, the Center for American Progress recently released a set of recommendations. But it won't be enough to codify responses to the specific abuses of this era. DOJ's culture of independence has to be reinforced to ensure that it's strong enough to push back against future abuses. As the saying goes, culture eats policy for breakfast. So we need a strong culture to go along with strong policies and strong laws. But, but if the culture in the career ranks at DOJ and the expectations that are held for leadership are unrelentingly steadfast in their failure to accept even a whiff of improper influence, then the rules that are newly reestablished will have strong guardians. To succeed in that work, the next generation of leaders at DOJ will have to take on the reputational damage that they've suffered explicitly. Candor with the public can restore damaged reputations, but very slowly, and only if the department acknowledges problems that occurred head on, um, they will have to demonstrate to the public their commitment to re-up a culture that explicitly teaches and demands that no political influence or any other kind of undue influence can be permitted to seep into prosecutors' decisions. And that gets us to the, the key point. They can't do that without the support of Americans everywhere. I mean, just regular everyday people, people who don't live and breathe the law or even think about it that much. We need Americans to believe that the rule of law matters and that restoring it is essential. So DOJ can't do this important work without the support of lawyers everywhere, helping communities process why it's so important to restore the rule of law. And particularly an influential bar like yours in New York has a role to play. It is a lot easier for lawyers to sit on the sidelines, but we don't have that luxury any longer. So I'm going to leave you with the words of Sherilyn Eiffel. She is the head of the Legal Defense Fund, uh, the litigating arm of the NAACP. We recently did a podcast together on the anniversary of women getting the right to vote. And we were talking about the Voting Rights Act um, and Congress, which has always previously passed and re-upped the act with close to unanimous bipartisan majorities, has failed to do so since it was gutted by the Supreme Court in Shelby County versus Holder. And Sherilyn discussed the obligations of lawyers when a fundamental right, the right of people to vote, is under attack. But it sort of morphed into something else, and we had a conversation about this era that we live in and her disappointment, which I share, with how lawyers have responded. And she said this. I really, as a lawyer, I've been quite hard on my own profession, to be frank, because I really believe that our profession has failed to step up. 
I think that many aspects of our pr profession, particularly since Trump was elected, have covered themselves in glory. Civil rights lawyers and civil liberties activists have stepped up, spoken out. The former US attorneys who've come forward and said this is outrageous. It's been a beautiful thing to see, but it's been a small group. And she continued and said, I think that there is some truth and reconciliation that this profession will need to try to diagnose what happened. And it's vital that we take responsibility as lawyers. So our profession has some work to do. I agree with her. Our profession has some work to do. And I'm proud of all of you for being here because that signifies your commitment to doing it. I look forward to getting it done along with all of you. Um, thanks very much for your time and your awkward attention in this Zoom format we're all now using. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Joyce. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, let me mention that we had hoped that Cheryl and Eiffel could be on this very panel today uh, with you uh, because of the very uh, point of view that you have just quoted her, but she wasn't able to be with us today. She, she's rather busy, as you can imagine. Um, I'm always glad to have the chance to channel Cheryl and the... <laughs> well, you've done very well without her. Uh, uh, there are a number of questions coming in, and, and uh, let me just ask you as they continue to come in, what kinds of things can ordinary citizens do uh, who, who accept exactly the proposition you've articulated, who believe how that law is very important, uh, but, but um, don't have any ability to go to court themselves. They can write to Congress. What else can they do? I think that's been one of the central frustrations of this era. People have felt like their hands are tied, like they were powerless, and they had no ability to impact any of these outcomes. But something that we've learned over time is that our collective voices matter. And so here's a great example. As we began to see what was going on at the post uh, office, under Postmaster DeJoy, a former Trump fundraiser who became the Postmaster General, and who by some reports was taking steps designed to slow down the delivery of absentee ballots and short circuit their use in the election. Everyday Americans were outraged. There were photographs, there was broad, broad uh, opposition to what was going on, and it was actually the voices of everyday Americans in unison that brought that situation to the forefront and forced the Trump administration to back down, forced DeJoy to testify on the Hill and to commit that he would prioritize the delivery of absentee ballots. So I think in some ways we've gotten beaten down over the last three and a half years. And we need to explicitly reject this narrative of powerlessness and sort of regain our, our obligation. The, the last thing that I did as US attorney was I attended a speech by Attorney General Loretta Lynch. She spoke at 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And she said, we have work to do. We are not powerless. And I have never forgotten those words. I hope everyone will have that same sense of feeling powerful particularly in this run up to the election. Okay, we now have um, an entirely predictable question from three or four different people. Do you believe the Attorney General should be disbarred? And do you also believe he should be impeached? So these are, I think, separate questions. And, and let me just talk about the impeachment question. I, I understand timing. I, I get that we're close to an election. But I'm not a political person, so my observations aren't driven by political realities. And, and there may be absolutely legitimate reasons in the political environment for not uh, taking on the, the notion of impeachment at this point in the game. You know, I, I just can't even begin to speculate about that. Purely as a legal proposition, the notion that an attorney general would engage in, in all of the conduct that Barr has engaged in and be subjected, you know, not even to a slap on the wrist, but to encouragement from a president. That seems both unconscionable in this specific setting and, and a really bad precedent to set for the future. We have to have checks and balances in our system of government. 
any other attorney general who had done, you know, half of this, who had done a tenth of this, his resignation or her resignation would have been demanded by the president. That's not what's happening here. We have a president who actually prefers to have a, a Roy Kahn sitting uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue at, at the Justice Department. And so really the last bastion, or maybe not the last, but the second to last bastion of a check and balance on this attorney general would be Congress. And impeachment, even if it doesn't result in conviction, sends a powerful message. Ultimately, I think in this situation, though, it will be up to us. It will be up to the voters to vote, to vote in record numbers, to show our confidence in our system of government, to show our confidence in democracy by voting and signifying our disapproval for this attorney general and others in this administration. And disbarment? So disbarment is a specific matter that turns on the rules and the jurisdiction that the attorney general is barred in. I know that there have been a number of suggestions of disbarment. Most recently, perhaps a letter written by prominent members of the DC bar isolating a series of circumstances of conduct engaged in by the attorney general that would warrant um, disbarring him. The reality is that sometimes bar associations are a little bit hesitant with DOJ figures. There's often a rule that bars um, will leave the investigation into the ethical conduct by a sitting or, or by a serving prosecutor in DOJ to DOJ's own internal discipline procedures. I'm not sure that there's ever been, a, or at least I can't remember, there likely has been, but a, but a serious, a serious challenge to the ethical conduct of a sitting attorney general such that disbarment is appropriate, I think it is unlikely that we will see action. And um, what is your prognosis if the president um, is reelected and um, the, the attorney general's tenure is continued or a successor is chosen based on the record uh, to date? So President Trump seems to be very satisfied with the performance of his attorney general. And I think it's likely that he would continue in office if there's a second Trump term. Um, and that is deeply problematic because right now, and look, it doesn't give me any pleasure to say this. I was hired during the George H.W. Bush administration and I've served under attorneys general, Republican and Democratic, and have had great admiration for all of them, while not always agreeing with everything that they did, Democrats um, and Republicans. But the reality is that this attorney general has acted much more like he's the president's attorney than the people's attorney. And the damage that he's doing involves not just individual cases, but the institution itself. So I think the answer to Barr's conduct, I'll probably sound like a broken down record here, is to vote and to talk with your friends and family and make sure that they understand that this alone is an issue that's worth voting on, that, that Bill Barr is not intent on protecting the rights of the American people and that we need a change in leadership at DOJ, not as a political proposition, but as a rule of law proposition. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think we're going to um, uh, give you a break at this point and um, give um, Dennis Parker an opportunity to comment um, on what you've said and what, what the others have said as well. But thank you very, very much, Joyce, for doing this. And uh, um, it's always a pleasure to hear your, your analysis and your, your defense of the principles of law. Thank you. Now, let me introduce to you Dennis Parker, who has been sitting patiently. Um, Dennis uh, Parker is the executive director of the National Center for Law and Economic Justice, <clears throat> uh, an organization that fights on behalf of low income and economically disadvantaged people, primarily through class action litigation and advocacy. Prior to joining NCLEJ, uh, Mr. Parker uh, headed the racial justice program at the ACLU, leading its efforts to combat discrimination in a variety of areas. Uh, before doing that, he was worked at the, uh, he was chief of the Civil Rights Bureau at the Office of the New York State Attorney General. And uh, prior to that, worked with the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. In short, he has worked in a variety of areas, all of which have sought to 
protect the legal rights of poor um, and minority uh, communities. He serves as an adjunct professor at Columbia Law School, Teachers College, and the New York Law School, where he teaches courses on education law and social change. He's a graduate of Harvard Law School and Middlebury College. Dennis Parker, welcome to the forum, and we look forward to hearing your views. Thank you very much, Steve. And um, Professor Vance described the nightmare of having to follow Professors Snyder and Sunstein, and, uh, Sunstein, and, and I have the added nightmare of having to follow those two and her. Um, but I am extremely honored to be on this panel and to have this important discussion. As Steve mentioned, I'm the executive director of the National Center for Law and Economic Justice, an organization that has for nearly 60 years fought, as its name suggests, for economic justice um, across the nation. In that capacity, we've had the privilege of representing recipients of public benefits, low-wage workers, persons with disabilities, and whole communities which have been victimized by unfair and racially discriminatory law enforcement practices and have been victimized by the criminalization of poverty in uh, general through practices, including ones like the unfair um, assessment and uh, collection of enforcement uh, um, and the collection and enforcement of uh, court costs and fees. I've been asked to address the question of, of equity and the role of law in particular the way it, is, it has been impacted by actions and, and policies since the 2016 election. And it struck me listening to the prior presentations before how much the clients whom we represent fall into those categories of people who reside in those zones where the, that are free of the rule of law, um, people who are, who live in um, the, the kind of zone where the rule of law that they experience is different from the rule of, of a law from so many Americans. Um, and the problems that we've been talking about all day are ones that are felt particularly strongly by these people. I'd like to start with a definition of equity, um, and in particular, one that recognizes that equity as a concept is related but distinct from um, equality. Whereas equality seeks to uh, provide everyone with the same things in order to enjoy full, healthy lives, equity tries to understand and give people what they need to enjoy full, healthy lives. Both of these share the same goal, but one, equality can only work if everyone starts from the same place. The distinguished critical race theorist, Professor Kim Crenshaw has illustrated the, the difference by likening equality to permitting everyone to watch a baseball game over a wooden fence, even though some people by virtue of their height or their, their use of a wheelchair are, are unable to see over the top of the fence. While equity aims to make it possible for everyone to observe the game by either providing steps or spaces in the wall that would permit them all to see. One other way in which equality and equity are alike is that despite the progress that has been made over the past few centuries in this country, we have not yet succeeded in achieving full equity or equality. And I'm sad to say that given our nation's history of discrimination and white supremacy, it is difficult at times not to be reminded when discussing progress of Malcolm X's suggestion that you can't drive a knife nine inches into a man's back and pull it out three inches and call it progress. Over the last half year, we have heard how the COVID-19 pandemic and the overwhelming evidence that was provided of cell phones and dealing with the the, the, the killing or the mistreatment of, of uh, Black people by the police department have widely exposed what has been known for a long time by advocates of equality and equity. And that is by so many uh, measures, whether 
talking about access to health care, employment, and adequate education, housing, access to the safety net of public uh, benefits, a safe environment, non-discriminatory and non-abusive treatment by law enforcement, and on and on. These are things that have long existed that preceded 2016. And no matter what happens with or the um, with COVID-19, will continue after that time. I will discuss, as have the other panelists, um, questions of, of equity and equality that have been highlighted since um, 2016 by the conduct of this administration. But in fact, I'd like to suggest that the new threats under the current administration, and con as considerable as they are, are built on a sturdy foundation of inequity and um, inequality. How do you measure the relationship between the rule of law in the United States and, and equity and equality? I, I'm going to depart company from, from my um, prof professorial former um, panel members and go not to um, a discussion or a definition that comes from the legal profession, but from the, the author James Baldwin. In No Name on the Streets, he wrote, if one really wishes to know how justice is administered in a country, one does not question the policemen, the lawyers, the judges, or the protected members of the middle class. One goes to the unprotected those precisely who need the law's protection most, and listens to their testimony. Those unprotected are the clients whom we at NCLEJ and so many other organizations have long sought um, to serve. And their testimony is an eloquent one that describes lack of economic opportunity, frequently in low paying jobs, which lead to the wide racial gap in wealth particularly among Black people, and despite the passage of the landmark, the landmark civil rights laws of the 1960s. It is a testimony that tells about massive differences in educational resources, from funding for supplies to access to experienced certified teachers. The unprotected can testify about continued segregation in housing and in education, even in that most progressive of cities, New York City, which as recent studies have shown, has the most segregated schools in the United States. Mm -hmm. Their testimony describes differences in access to health care, differences in treatment by law enforcement, and differences in so many other areas. Why are these groups so unprotected? In a country in particular that values or states that it values, equality before the law. The, the testimony that, that we have from these groups suggests that, that, although I've been speaking largely about Black individuals and, um, and our communities, that those, those differences affect other ones and have a profound um, destructive impacts on Native Americans, on immigrants, on people with disabilities and on, on people of uh, color more uh, broadly. And in response to the question of why this happens, why these groups are unprotected, part of the reason for the lack of protection is the undeniable fact that laws, even those that have the greatest impact on the unprotected, and especially those who have the greatest impact on the unprotected, are not made by those who feel that impact. And even when laws are passed that should provide protections too frequently, those laws promise more than they actually deliver in terms of life experience of the unprotected people. One example of this that has stayed with me for years was one given by uh, Michelle Alexander, who conducting a book discussion of her book, The New Jim Crow, um, recounted a story of a young man who had attended a Know Your Rights program she had given when she was serving as the racial justice director of the ACLU's Northern California um, affiliate. 
The young man, after being stopped by the police, shared his newly attained knowledge of the law and of stop and frisk with the police officer who stopped him and was promptly savagely beaten for his efforts. The experience of someone invoking their legal rights and then suffering physical consequences is not limited to that one man and is one that is a common experience for those groups of unprotected people whom I described before. It is sadly a, a, a sadly common experience. And although it is true that as, as bad as things were for too many um, Americans before 2016, they have become immeasurably worse since. We heard the discussions of the way that the, the Justice Department has failed to live up to its mandate um, to serve the United States, um, to uh, provide justice for the whole country. And one of the ways when, in which that has happened is the retreat of the Justice Department from so many areas where they at least theoretically were intended to protect the, the rights of those un, uh, protect, uh, of the unprotected. Um, examples include the investigation of uh, police of, of our retreating from the investigation of a, of a police misconduct while simultaneously ramping up the federal prosecution of people at protest demonstrations. The, the withdrawal of guidances by the education and justice departments that were intended to address the, crip, the crippling impact of the school to prison pipeline, as well as efforts to channel reforth our resources intended for uh, COVID-19, our relief from public schools to private schools by the Department of, of Education represent a giant step backwards from um, equality and equity. Efforts to undermine a successful census by shortening the time period for the census count and efforts to eliminate undocumented persons from the count, notwithstanding the clear language of the constitution are also blatant attempts to remove the unprotected uh, from the census count and thereby uh, deny them access to federal funding and represent and our representation and as such are an affront to equality and equity. Repeated federal efforts to limit access to public uh, benefits by the imposition of work requirements, which all reliable evidence demonstrates do not encourage um, employment, but instead only disqualify and uh, deny benefit our recipients and um, access to, um, to the safety net um, are another example of the way that equity and equality are uh, frustrated. Efforts by the, the uh, Department of Housing and Urban uh, Development to end the affirmatively fur uh, furthering uh, fair housing duty, ones that would be in, instrumental in ending housing segregation um, are yet one more example of um, inequality and um, inequity. And significantly, those efforts are ones that really affect negatively the gateway to opportunity, whether you're speaking about schools, employment, or housing. All of those are meant to be and are often described as ways to change your circumstances to achieve the American dream. And under this administration, those pathways have all been increasingly uh, blocked. In so many areas from immigration to tax policy to environmental protection, so many of this administration's tactics are designed to push back progress, in effect, to push the knife further back in. And in no area is that effort more true than in the appointment of uh, judges. Who, uh, we've seen the, the large number of uh, judicial confirmations of people who, um, who are chosen because of their willingness to, to uh, decide um, in conjunction with the administration on extremely conservative um, issues in, in a ways that will hurt these unprotected even more. And in fact, 
10 of the, of, the, of the judges nominated thus far by the administration have received a not qualified rating from the American Bar Association, but for the overwhelming majority of those that has not been um, a, a barrier. And when you add to these actions, the fact that the statements by the president seem to suggest support for violating laws dealing with freedom of speech, um, dealing um, with voting, um, all of these things are a particular irony when so much of this conversation centers on law and order. Taken together, it's a grim picture. Some of my students, and I, I teach as an adjunct professor, um, have commented that my comments on law seem very pessimistic and cynical. Um, and I can understand why they, they feel that. I think that that is um, sometimes a reflection of, of, um, of how I feel. Um, but I do like to tell them, and I would like to speak today, a little bit about why I persist in being actively involved in this struggle for equality and equity. And again, let me go outside of the field of law into, or at least somewhat outside of the field of law in, in, into the area of, of literature. A formative experience in my legal life was seeing the film of the play, A Man for All Seasons. And you undoubtedly remember that the play was based on the life of the lawyer and saint, Thomas More. And saying the words lawyer and saint, it occurs to me that those two words frequently don't appear together in a sentence without the word not between them. But be that as it may, um, Thomas More served as the as a Lord Chancellor who served under Henry VIII, the tyrannical, impulsive, narcissistic king who was notoriously disrespectful of women as well as many of the subjects in general in in his um, country. Um, it's hard to imagine a time when such a leader could be in power. But like so many other such leaders, Henry looked for assent for his misdeeds and looked for undy undying loyalty from those around him. In this case, he wanted acqui acquiescence for his, his um, annulment from his wife, Catherine, to marry Anna Boleyn something that Thomas opposed for religious reasons. And in a conversation with his son-in-law, William Roper, about the danger he was in because of his opposition to the king's plan, Thomas's response in the play is to invoke the law and the rule of law, saying he would rely upon the law for his, his uh, protection, even being willing to extend the law to the devil himself. And it's a very moving speech William Roper says to him, so now you give the devil the benefit of law. And, um, and uh, Thomas More says, yes, what would you do? And Roper says, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. And Thomas More says, oh, and when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper? The law is all being flat. This country is planted thick with, with laws from coast to coast man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down and you're just the man to do it, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I give the devil benefit of, of law for my own safety's sake. And I was always inspired by this speech and his strong belief and, and confidence in the rule of law and found inspiration in the quote. But I also remembered what happened to Thomas More, that despite his conscience and belief in the power of the rule of law, he was ultimately uh, beheaded. And I often wonder what he thought as he approached the scaffold regard, um, what he thought about the, the limits of law, how he would have then answered the question about the protective power of law. And I like to think that he would, he would have seen his fate as, as the result of an extreme perversion of the law, one that could have been averted if the society in which he lived had been true to the law and insisted on its application to everyone, no matter how powerful. We're not, at least yet, subject to um, immediate decapitation. 
But there are fundamental and vital things at stake in the current climate, including equity and equality, and perhaps democracy itself. What will happen next in large part depends on how we respond to those threats. In the James Baldwin piece that I quoted earlier, Baldwin goes on to ask the rhetorical question, does the law exist for the purpose of furthering the ambitions of those who have sworn to uphold the law, or is it seriously be, to be considered as a moral unifying force, the health and strength of a nation? The answer to me is an obvious one, and it is a call for each of us in the position to do so, to insist upon the creation and enforcement of fair laws, one that will end two systems of law, um, and one that will work on behalf of the health and strength of the entire nation. And so toward that end, I will end with a quote from another prominent non-lawyer, the Nobel laureate, Toni Morrison, who says, I tell my students, when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. Let's each of us resolve to do our jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very, very much for those um, insights and inspiring words. Um, the floor is open for questions. Um, I, I don't think Joyce Vance is still with us, but if she is, she could reappear and you are. And uh, thank you, Joyce. Um, and, uh, the floor is open for questions to either one of them. And if you would send them to, to in, in on the uh, Q&A, I will, I will read them. Um, I, Joyce, um, there were some questions that came in after you spoke that I think will be relevant to what Dennis Parker has said as well. Um, if, if the public turns its back on the concerns that you and others have articulated today and reelects um, an administration that seems to value laws so little. Um, what, what does that say about the community in which we're living and prospects for addressing the larger underlying issues that Professor Snyder mentioned to us. Is that for Dennis or for me? It's, uh, it's for both of you. Either one. Dennis, go first. Why don't we, why don't you go first, Joyce? And then Dennis will go next. So, um, as a prosecutor, I had an answer for a lot of problems that I think applies here. And, and the answer to questions like, how do you reduce crime? How do you make communities safer? It's education. It's a real commitment to civic education. And I think that's um, what we have to rethink fundamentally in this country is how do we educate our fellow citizens about this um, contract that we have as Americans? What does our constitution mean? What are our obligations? Because a lot of the problems that we've seen and, and some of the electoral issues that we face are based on people who haven't had the opportunity to learn about the system in its entirety. So that's my sort of short answer. It's a, an education failure that we need to take on. Dennis? Sure. I, I, you know, it, it's hard and it's, it's easy to fall into cynicism. I, I know of, of theorists who suggest that, that the inequality we see is not the result of ignorance as much as it is the intended consequence of the structures that have been built. Um, 
and, and I do have to admit to being discouraged sometimes at, at the, the um, number of people who, at least in my view, are willing to, if not support racism and inequality, at least to tolerate because there are other gains to be made, whether they're economic or, or other social gains. But at the same time, I've been heartened by the response that we have seen publicly over the last few months. Um, I've been heartened by the fact that at least there's some indications that the, the, the dog whistle politics um, that, that the president has engaged in may not be successful this time. And I am hopeful that, that the, the efforts to, to win an election based on fear, to win an election based on, on othering, again, those protected or those unprotected people whom I discussed before to divide the country. I am hopeful that, that, that um, the country will come together and reject those. Um, even if it does, we will still be, there will still be, and I will always be um, discouraged by the number of people um, who, who seem to be unaffected by the things that seem so obvious to me. But I think that, 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 that there's a pathway for that to happen. Um, and, you know, would join in Professor Vance in, in saying that we need to vote, but we also need to recognize that the, the effort's going to be a long one um, and that we're going to have to address some of these underlying problems, regardless of who wins the election. Professor Snyder said that, uh, in his view, one of the problems is that people don't believe in the future as much as they used to. And that failure to believe in the, f in the future leaves a country uh, vulnerable to the passions and the demagoguery of the present. Uh, a large part of our electorate and large increasing share of our overall community uh, has had a very difficult future uh, and continues to face a very difficult future. And I'm thinking about the black community, the Latino community, um, immigrant community generally, and those who have suffered at the very bottom of the economic ladder. Uh, your comments suggest that uh, to have them believe in the future and begin to respond to the Snyder analysis means that we have to address equality, not just because we like to or say we like to, but because it's important to create a constituency for the rule of law itself. Uh, maybe that's not the primary reason, but that we cannot expect allegiance to the rule of law from a large part of the community that doesn't seem to be benefited by it. Is that? I, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it is, it is not a question of, of, of people making a sacrifice um, for, um, to benefit people who are excluded or feel excluded from the rule of law. I honestly think that we are hobbled as a country because of our failure to provide a consistent rule of law that includes everyone, that it, it limits our potential, that it holds us back, and it diminishes every one of us um, when we don't give people the opportunity to achieve um, their potential and to uh, contribute to society. So it's something that is necessary for everyone. But I do know that there is, understandably perhaps, a sense of hopelessness um, in, in large parts of the country. I mean, the, the hopelessness that arises, you know, I think of our clients who are, who are mired in poverty because they are saddled with thousands, do thousands of uh, dollars in fines and fees for minor traffic offenses and can't pull their way out of it because of that. I think of the people who, like me, have the frustration of seeing on video, black people being killed by the police 
and waiting for months for the, the police officers who shot our Breonna Taylor to be disciplined, or even worse, seeing uh, cases in those rare instances when people are arrested and tried where they're found not guilty. And so that hopelessness is part of what needs to be addressed. And, you know, I remember in 2016, one of my great memories um, actually comes from Saturday Night Live, where after the election, there was an episode where there's a party of white liberals um, who were talking about how shocked and upset they are about the election. And, and there are two black people in the party and they're saying, not surprised at all. That, that somewhat funny, but also an indication of the level of hopelessness and frustration that exists and has to be addressed in order for, for there to be you know, belief in the rule of law. I mean, the other thing, and I'm sorry that I'm talking so much, but, but the, I was very moved. I'm, I'm not a football fan, so I can't state his name. Um, but the, the coach who talked about the extraordinary contrast be between the belief that particularly Black people have had in this country, the willingness to go to war, the, the willingness to do all those things, even, even when they were systematically deprived, even when we were systematically deprived of rights. Um, and that is both poignant and tragic, but it is, it is also a suggestion of, of how committed um, people are to, to trying to achieve the ideals of the country. Um, uh, there's a question here from Bettina for you, Dave, uh, Dennis. Could you please share more your thoughts on where persons in a zone of lawlessness as defined by Professor Snyder, could possibly find faith in the rule of law. It's quite different, says, the, says Bettina, from this, the situation of Thomas More, who was, after all, in a position of great power. Right, and of course, the irony is that that power ultimately didn't protect him. Um, but, but yes, it is more difficult for people who have- Have we frozen? Um, you have, yes. Did you hear me? Did you hear the question? I, I did, I did. Um, and I was saying that, 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 that it is, you know, clearly um, a greater challenge for people who are disenfranchised in, in, um, in so many ways from, from the protection of the rule of law. Um, I, I think that there are a number of things that, that organizations of uh, communities, um, grassroots organizing um, has, has been um, both an effective and, and heartening um, alternative to, to, to just being resigned to not being able to get justice. I, I think that the, the reaction of an increasing number of young people calling for uh, justice is, is a heartening development. But I don't, I don't underestimate at all the difficulty of, of changing um, policies and practices that have been in effect for literally the history of the country. Um, but, um, but there has to be a way forward and, and, and some of that is by empowering uh, communities and self-empowering the, the uh, communities. Joyce, is there something you wanted to add at that point? Um, I apologize. I've been distracted by my German Shepherd puppy who has come down here demanding attention. Apparently, I've been gone for too long, and I lost the tail end of Dennis's comments there. But I actually did want to chime in on the earlier question where we were talking about people um, who have lost hope. And, and I wanted to offer a concrete example to bolster Dennis's comments. I used to do a lot of work with people who had finished serving their sentence in, in prison and were returning to their communities. And so I live in Alabama, where we have um, a very deliberate history, you know, sort of a straight line from 
slavery to convict labor to, to Jim Crow to mass incarceration of, of black people. Um, it is unambiguous. And so when you talk to people who are returning to their community from prison, an outsized number of them compared to the general population will be black or will be Hispanic. Many of them will be immigrants. And what always struck me as being so alarming was that we disenfranchised them. You know, we took away their right to vote essentially permanently. Um, and nothing really said, welcome back to the community. You know, you've paid your debts to society and now we want you to have a productive uh, life, like, but you still can't vote. Now that's changed a little bit. The Alabama legislature has recently passed legislation that restores the right to vote to some categories um, of people who were previously convicted of felonies. The law is ambiguous and can be difficult to parse and many people don't seek to restore or exercise their right because they're concerned about being prosecuted. We're all aware of what's going on in Florida where the citizens voted to restore the right to vote and that was overrode effectively by elected Republican officials. But it seems to me that if we wanna make people feel hopeful about the future, then they deserve to be included in our community to have full rights as citizens. And I firmly agree that until we address our history of racial injustice, we cannot move forward. We have to find ways to, to underline to people that they are part of the community. It seems to me that expanding the right to vote, not restricting it is a good place to start if we wanna undo this notion of hopelessness which, you know, you don't have to be a, a historian, you can just be a passing student of history like I am to understand how dangerous hopelessness was in Germany in the period between the two great wars. Well, thank you for bringing us back to where we started today. Let me um, just give you each one last question um, from among the many questions that have come in. But other than voting, other than voting, what single thing can lawyers do at this point to address the problems we have been um, cataloging today? Dennis, you wanna go first? Well, let me start. Um, and, and, you know, I was very moved when Joyce talked about my former colleague, Cheryl and I Phil's, um, mandate to lawyers of the need to step up and not just the people who do this for a living, but, but, but to people in every kind of practice. Um, and, and that means being concerned with and being conversant with all of the challenges to the rule of law. This series is, I think, a really extraordinary example of, um, of the kind of information that has to be shared among lawyers, but also has to be acted on. And to recognize that, that unless you are, you are, you know, in the discussion of racism, there's a discussion of the need not to discriminate, but there's also a stronger need to be anti-racist. And I think that, that lawyers have a responsibility to do everything in their power to be anti those who would tear down the rule of law and to find ways within their practices to uh, support it. I know it's a little bit vague, but, but, um, but I think that, that there are ways that it can be done and that it must be done. Joyce, you get the last word. I think it's easy for lawyers to underestimate how influential they can be in their communities. We need to really focus on that and what the outcome of this election is. And I remember the proudest I have ever been to be a lawyer was when the Trump administration instituted the Muslim ban and we watched lawyers and, and not just civil rights lawyers, but people in private practice going out to airports and representing people, asking if they needed a lawyer. I sort of get chills thinking about it again. One of my former colleagues, the US attorney in Seattle, now the mayor sort of physically put herself um, between a flight leaving with people on it who would not be returned to this country if the flight took off um, and, and sort of physically refused to let it leave. We need to find ways to, to do that. 
there is injustice going on in this country and look, it, it preceded Trump. I don't think that we should pretend it was a perfect picture before then. We had plenty of problems that needed to be solved. We are overdue for major criminal justice reform. We have racial issues that will impede our progress as a country if we don't deal with them. Um, and a lot more than that. It is time for the lawyers to, to stand up and to help lead their communities forward instead of thinking that we don't have an obligation in that regard. Well, you did get the last word. Um, and um, thank you both very much. You've been here the entire time. It's a testament itself of your own commitment um, to the principles we're talking about. And thank you, all these several hundred people who've stayed with us the whole time. And I want to remind you all that our next session is next Tuesday, September 22 at 1 o'clock where we have um, another wonderful discussion ahead of us. Um, um, though I have to say that our four speakers today, all four of them, set the tone for exactly what we were hoping to accomplish here and um, shared with, with all of us uh, real wisdom and real experience. And uh, on behalf of all of us at the City Bar, let me thank you, Joyce. Let me thank you, Dennis. Thank you to for uh, to uh, Tim Snyder and Cass Sunstein, who both had to leave. but And thank you, of course, to uh, the president of the association, Sheila Boston. Thank you. And uh, we will see you next week, 1 o'clock on the 22nd of September. Thank you and, and goodbye. <laughs>